Hello everyone. Welcome to today's satsang. Today is Monday the 23rd of November. A uh, lots of plans, lots of discussion happening for the celebration for Ishwar ji's birthday. We will all keep you posted on what happens. Some exciting thing is going to come up. Uh moving forward to today's schedule, we have uh Sister Juhi. She has a special song for Ishwar ji. It means uh give me strength, O oh Lord. Uh then we'll have a short talk by Michael as usual. uh then we will have a nice reading session by shalina and she is reading from uh the source at rssb.org and she is going to read about an uh, a very interesting article there uh, the ultimate act of courage which was said by a great master then we'll proceed to the short dhyan session then to ishwar ji's youtube talk and then we'll all meditate together with love and devotion so now i request by michael to play juhi's song मुझे को दे ताकत खुदा और बख्श दे पाकी मुझे को दे ताकत खुदा और बख्श दे पाकी अपनी मान अपनी मानिंदले बना और दे मुझे नई जिंदगी मुझे को दे ताकत खुदा और बख्श दे पाकिगी हर कमी खुदा और बख्श दे 
पाकी अपने मान बले बना अपने मान बले बना और दे मुझे नई जिंदगी मुझे को दे ताकत खुदा और बख्श दे पाकी प्रेम ही प्रेम इस जहाँ से है ईश्वर तूने किया माफ उसको भी किया जिसने प्रेम की राचले तेरी तरह जिंदगी मुझ को दे ताकत खुदा और बख्श दे पाकी मुझ को दे ताकत खुदा और बख्श दे पाकी Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Satsang. So nice to see you all here. Um, I wanted to thank my dear sister Juhi for her beautiful shout. Give me strength, O oh Lord, and bless me. Make me like you. Bless me with sacredness. As this prayer should be, it is actually my prayer every day to uh, beg the Lord, beseech the Lord to give me strength and to give me sacredness and keep me connected to him as it is as we live in this world and our enemy is always with us waiting for any second any moment to just snatch godliness from us to snatch our treasures and we if we are not careful then um, the mind which is totally opposite of god that always it's it's its direction, its compass, always towards the dirty drain, wants to take us that way. And uh, we have to really keep our uh, prayers to Master, prayers to God, to keep uh, the golden leash on us, as those who really want to go to the kingdom of God, those who want to be on list A of reaching God in this life and not wanting to come back or go to the astral region and meditate there for thousands of years or the causal plane, that those who want to go to God and make this uh, pledge with Father God, with Master, that this I want this to be my last lifetime. I want to be on list A for bliss and joy and the kingdom of God and such kind. Then also there is a great help from Master that even when the mind wants to do it tries to drive us one way then each moment is in the hands of master and he changes situations he changes situations to put a hold on the mind and make his disciple go forward and uh, you could test that and you could see that in your daily life we could see that in our daily life that whenever the mind wants to play a trick um, and take us the other way then there is always master. There's always master to save us. There's always master to, um, uh, to take us, put us on the right direction, put us on the right direction of grace and of sacredness and of holiness and keep us away from all what causes suffering, all what causes depression and all what just drains us of our livelihood and of our bliss and of our joy that we collect from God and we collect from Master. So 
this is really why we all gather here every day. We gather here every day because those moments, this mom, these, mom, these precious moments of satsang are so precious because why? Because we don't think of the past and we don't think of the future. We just sit here completely absorbed in master, completely absorbed in his love. And we, and we imbibe his teachings, the sacred teachings of St. Matt. As St. Kirpal Singh says, that satsang is the central theme of all sacred teachings. That satsang is the sacred uh, theme, is the central theme of all sacred teachings. And uh, these moments that we sit together, we invoke, we invoke the blessings and the grace of the master who is with us every day in spirit, who is with us every day in spirit as when we think of him, then he is there. So satsang, since time began, has been a time of grace when all gather in the name of the Holy One, all gather in his love, in his warm uh, thought. When we think of him, we uh, praise him, we think of him as Naftij in the beginning Shabd was thinking for Vastar, he made me want to dance. Uh, so we all, it's, we all start dancing on the godly tune in satsang. And satsang really weeds out all imperfections, weeds out all imperfections, all the bad smells that come out of lust and greed and ego and, uh, and, and jealousy and attachments. These are all washed out at the time of satsang. At the time of satsang, so much grace, so much blessing is poured on us and I feel it, I enjoy it every day and it keeps me, it keeps me going the right direction. As if you have a wild horse and you tie it uh, with a tether, you tie, you tie it, then it will try to break that, uh, that rope and it will try to, uh, to spring forth. However, at the end of the rope, it stops with a jerk. It stops with a big jerk. And the same thing here, what satsang and the thinking of master and meditation does to our mind, that our mind wants to run away and then it is re really pulled back. So satsang pulls back the mind, pulls back the mind with the power and the grace of the master, pulls back the mind just like that wild horse, when it reaches the end of the rope, it's pulled back with a jerk. And then after a while, after a while, what happens is the wild horse starts to learn that there is a jerk at the end of the rope and it starts to become more docile and more timid and then obeys. So satsang make us really obey the commandments of the master. It keeps us on the right direction and it keeps the blessings uh, of mercy and grace flowing towards us and it weeds out all our imperfections that slowly, slowly, one by one, all our enemies within us, all the enemies within us, will be weeded out, will be weeded out, and then we will complete the course of Simran. And what is completing the course of Simran? Completing the course of Simran, as Sanji says, is to see the inner luminous form of the master and to be able to hear the inner luminous form of the master and talk to him just like I'm talking to you now, is that when we complete the course of Simran and then we, we, um, we concentrate within, then we see the luminous form of the master and he will be talking to us like I'm talking to you now and we will hear him and have all types of conversations with him. Is this, is the cent this is also the central point of success of Saint Mat, of, of, uh, of uh, any disciple who is on this path, walking this path of love, is that the, when this disciple completes the course of Simran and then Simran becomes automatic, therefore, and it, no effort, it becomes effortless and automatic and always resounding. And then the inner form of the master appears in us and starts talking to us. This is like a great spiritual attainment that the saints talk about that we should all be, all strive for. As coming to satsang, we're all absor uh, uh, we're absorbed, absorbed in master that we, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters where we are and where our surrounding doesn't matter. We learn how to concentrate because we are observed in the Holy One, absorbed. We are totally, totally and fully absorbed 
in the in the holy one losing all consciousness except the holy presence of the master that we lose all consciousness except thinking of the holy presence of the master and then nothing else is there except us and master and that is when we become receptive that's when receptivity is there and the flow of grace starts so coming to satsang helps us in concentration helps us to learn how to concentrate um it helps us guru nanak says that those who achieved concentration they are in any place you put them they are in the secluded place that they that's what guru nanak says that when we achieve concentration even if we have dogs barking next to us trains passing people talking even if it's a war zone but when we achieve concentration then we sit here and we just concentrate on the third eye center where master is waiting for us with open arms and then we become oblivious to the people next to us all to all noises and to all uh, uh, to uh, to every to, to all disturbances that are coming from outside and we will be absorbed only in master and that is what uh, the uh, the people who like learn they 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 know how to do archery or uh, shooting at the target is that they only see the target and they don't see nothing else and that's when they hit the target right in the bull's eye in the middle that satsang really also helps us uh, in concentration that those uh, who uh, people who don't con uh, who don't concentrate is that they have not uh, attained the art of uh, concentration they have not learned the art of how to concentrate so coming to satsang also helps us concentrate why because it weeds out all imperfection slowly and slowly and makes us gives us a, a, a place of sanctity a place of sanctuary uh, where we come here and sit in the sanctity of the master and then add godly virtues godly attributes to us to add all these beautiful godly qualities to us day after day after day which makes us more happy more joyous and more powerful in god and with strong roots deep roots in god and deep roots in the kingdom of god this is what when we all sit together in the company of the perfect one when we sit in his name then this is what happens we our roots grow stronger our connection with father god and master becomes very 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 strong and the mind is controlled even when it tries to go the opposite way and there is a story my my master santakar singh used to say that there was a person uh, who wanted to go see the master because the master asked him to come see him so he had to travel two days and then while he was going towards his master uh, he his mind he, he saw uh, uh, houses of uh, uh, with the red light on that means it's like houses of prostitutes and he was like oh you know yeah maybe i should just like stay here uh, for one night and then tomorrow i'll go see the master so his mind dragged him there and then he knocked on the first door and then a man came out and he started screaming at him what are you doing here you pervert get out of here and then he started running <laughs> he went out then he went out to the other uh, place where there is a, a red light and the same thing it, it looked like even the same man coming out and screaming at him the same thing so then he kept he just like got shocked and he then he he he, he did not sleep that night and he kept going towards the master when he reached the master when he reached the master in the morning they told him uh, and he was waiting for his the time to go see the master they told him now it's time to go see the master the master was sitting on a chair and he had his eyes closed and his head like this and uh, and then uh, the disciple asked him hi master i'm here to see you and then the master kept like putting his head like that and then uh, and then uh, and then the disciple asked him uh, how come your head is down how come you're uh, not listening to me and then the master said well you kept me up all night as a guard as a guard on the doors of the prostitutes <laughs> trying to not make you go inside that's why i'm tired and now i can <laughs> so when we develop that connection stronger and stronger and stronger connection with father god and master then 
He will not let our mind act in the way it wants to act. He will change the situation. He will change the situation and he will control as each moment full control from master is there. This is just my introduction for today. And just like my sister Ju, he said, give us strength, O Lord, bless us, bless us. And with sacredness, then I have this prayer again and again. And we, I hope all of us have this prayer that, Father God, that Master keeps giving us strength that to walk in this world of negativity where everything, where we are walking against the flow of God, where we are walking, I mean, against the flow. That to go to God, we have to go against the flow of this world, which is the negative world, and everybody is going in one direction. The majority, 99.9, 99.9 of the people oppose us because they're going on a different direction and we have to put some effort we have to put some effort to go to god to be able to handle all criticism that comes from families and friends and this world and we have to be really conscious co-workers of the divine plan that this is what mahip was talking about yesterday that spiritual warriors that we become spiritual warriors we become spiritual warriors to carry the torch of light to God and the king of God and the kingdom of God to this world. That to, get it, to carry that torch of light, that torch of, lo uh, of love, to carry that torch of love, then we have to change ourselves first, weed out all imperfections, slowly, slowly, slowly with the grace of the master, and then carry this torch and light up the whole world because we are his warriors. We are the warriors of God over here. We are all his spiritual warriors and he depends on us. He depends on us to carry his message, to carry the teachings of Guru Nanak, to carry the teachings of Baba Sawan Singh and to spread this message of love. And how do we spread this message of love? We have to do more and more and more meditation, more satsang. And the next three days, it's, uh, we will announce soon, but uh, 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 there'll be intensive meditations and we will announce it soon and we will in these three days there'll be because it's master's birthday then i'm sure he's gonna just flood us flood us with the grace and love and blessings and those who like sit in meditation they and really reuse i'm thinking of taking the whole weekend off and just meditating to get to absorb all the blessings that are coming from master's birthday and to really go not just one step, but many, many steps forward towards my real destination, my homeland, my country of God, that Father God is waiting there. I can't wait. So uh, um, now uh, I welcome my sister Shalina and I hope my sister Shalina will start coming to satsang more and more because the mind, uh, take a uh, mind puts all excuses puts all excuses for us not to come to satsang that this is how the mind attacks us first it, it, it makes us miss satsang and then it will take simran away and then it will uh, absorb us in a, like uh, in a, like not in thinking of other things so like satsang is very very powerful and i hope everybody uh, everybody connects with satsang and or listens later to satsang and then imbibes all the blessings, the flood of blessings that come. So I'm looking forward to my sister Shalina's talk and I'm going to play it right now um, and, uh, and I'm gonna enjoy, we're all going to enjoy. Okay. Thank you, Master and the Satsang Committee for enabling me to perform service to the Satsang community. Today, I read you an essay written on the ultimate act of courage in meditation from rssb.org. The subject of this talk is the ultimate act of courage, and it is based on a question that was asked of Huzur Maharaji many years ago when the Master was asked, Talking about courage, what kind of heroism is required in our meditation? The answer was a surprise. Margie said, 
we should try to be regular and punctual as much as we can. And as a matter of routine and as a matter of duty, we must attend to our meditation without any excitement to see anything inside. It should become a part of ourselves, be a part of our daily duty, and then automatically it will start reflecting in our daily life. So why was this a surprise? We know that meditation is the answer to most questions, but how is it that meditation is an act of courage? And here he goes into explaining with three different examples. The first one being a, a soldier that is going into battle. The second one, second one is an explorer climbing Mount Everest. And the third one is a person who is terminally ill facing death boldly at that. A soldier who fights bravely is given a medal for his courage. He makes an ultimate sacrifice. He dies in battle and he's given a special medal. An explorer is one who conquers the Mount Everest and is given a place in history for his courageous accomplishment. And a terminally ill person who succumbs after facing death with equanimity is eulogized as having great courage. So if we're doing our Simran and Bhajan regularly and punctually with love and devotion, how can that be an act of courage? Because we are that soldier, but we're fighting the most formidable and insidious of all enemies, the mind. We are the explorer attempting to climb the most difficult of mountains, the mountain of light within the body. We are that terminally ill patient facing death, not just the death of the body, but the death of the self, the ego, and our separate existence, which has truly been the cause of all of our suffering. So if we go back to the example of the soldier, Huzur was asked, could you explain if there is a difference between being a warrior on the path and being a satsangi? Huzur said, being a warrior on the path is just a way of expressing the idea that you have to fight with the mind, with your senses, just as the warrior fights with his enemies. He's frightened, not even of death. No matter how much hardship he has to go through, he wants to fight. He looks ahead. Similarly, our attitude should be to fight with the mind, fight with our senses, fight with our weakness like a warrior. And that's only a way of expression. And then there was another question. So there's no distinct, distinction between a warrior and a satsangi? And Huzur says, every satsangi is a warrior. A warrior is never frightened of death. He sacrifices so many things. He doesn't look back at all. He never worries what will happen to my wife, what will happen to my children, what if I'm killed, how are they going to live? You know, his aim is to fight and conquer and be victorious. Similarly, our aim in meditation should be to be like a warrior. We shouldn't worry. We shouldn't worry about leaving this creation and what will happen to my children, what will happen to my spouse, I've collected so much wealth, what will happen to it. We must absolutely pull our mind from all of these things and be prepared to sacrifice everything to achieve our end. And in response to another question about meditation, Huzur says, you know, the general equips his soldiers to fight the enemy. He wants each soldier to fight. He's at the back, just guiding them, equipping them, gives them ammunition to look after all of the soldier's needs. But ultimately, the soldier has to fight. The soldier can't tell his general to come and fight in the front of lines for him. We have to do our part. We have to play our part. And we are equipped to play our part. Therefore, we have to fight with our enemy, which is our mind, which is attracted to this creation. When we think about a boxer in the rink, 
A boxer is described to having a lot of heart, and it means that he never gives up. He may get knocked down, but then he gets up to fight back again. He may be bloody, but he doesn't stop. He gives it everything he's got. Even if he loses the fight, he's still respected for his courage and persistence. Similarly, we should approach our meditation with a lot of heart. The mind is so powerful and it constantly beats us up. But if we approach our meditation with a lot of heart, we will keep coming back with our Simran and Dhyan. We'll lose so many battles, but each time our will will get stronger. Our desire to reach the third eye center and to be with the master will increase many fold. We need to understand the virtue of failure. Now, if we fail, it means we've tried. And if we've tried, it means we've grown. That's why the great master said, bring me your failures. Does the child who is learning to walk fail when he falls down? In fact, it's just part of the process that leads to success. So many great and famous people embrace failure as it is key to their success. We have all heard about the story of Thomas Edison, who went through 10,000 experiments before he built a battery that worked. So when a reporter asked him how he felt when he failed 10,000 times, Edison replied, failed? I've not failed 10,000 times. I've successfully found 10,000 ways that it will not work. So if we keep at it, eventually the mind will become motionless and will accomplish our goal. Ultimately, we are destined to succeed. In the meantime, we have to recognize that our mind is our mortal enemy because it causes us so much pain and suffering and it stands between us and someone we love. Shouldn't we be angry with the mind for all its tricks, for keeping us enslaved in this world, for all the suffering it has caused us and for keeping us away from the one that we truly want to be with within? We have become conscious that this mind is no friend of ours. So enough is enough. Isn't it time to say, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Huzur writes, do not feel helpless or desperate, but keep up that struggle and be brave like a soldier. Tell the mind that you're not going to yield to it anymore and that you're going to lead a new life altogether. So as practitioners of meditation, we need to say no to the mind. And when it desires anything that it that that it can't that it wants to have, that sets us back. We avoid the biggest setbacks by living a healthy moral lifestyle, by avoiding meat, fish, eggs, drugs, and alcohol. The meditation that we practice is saying no to the mind at the very root, the level of thought, because the mind wants to think of something else and we're replacing those with thoughts of Simran. So we start doing Simran, and then we forget Simran, and then we start thinking about worldly things. And then again, we bring our mind back to Simran. We just keep bringing it back over and over again. Now that's a constant struggle because the mind wants to go back to its old habits. But with Simran and Dhyan, we're in fact reprogramming our mind with new and much more beneficial habits. Great master said, the mind is our only enemy in this world. So do not lose heart. Keep meditating. Simran is very powerful. When perfected, it has the power to stop a moving train. The mind is an opportunist. It waits for a moment of weakness when we let our guard down. So a satsangi needs to remain alert in every moment of every day. Now, it would have been much easier if the need to act and to be conscious was limited to one day or one moment. But for a satsangi, the act of courage is done every day. 
attending to our Simran and Bhajan regularly and punctually with love and devotion. When we think about the explorer, we're also very much the explorer. Just as great explorers sought to scale the highest mountains, we're seeking to climb through the mountain of this body to the apex behind the eyes. An explorer goes where few are feared to tread. He seeks to find a brave new world on the outside, just as we seek to enter the world of spirit on the inside. What dis dis distinguishes the great explorers and adventurers of the world from others? is an unshakable faith and an indomitable will. Without faith in their enterprise, their work would be impossible. Without faith, they would have never been able to suffer all the difficulties and hardships along the way. So in the same way, complete faith in our master is a prerequisite for achieving spiritual progress. When we begin with just a little bit of faith and trust in the master, and his teachings, and this gives us the courage to do our Simran and Bhajan regularly and punctually. Babaji always says, just do it. He just wants us to dive in and get started. We need to put all our reservations aside and get down to it with complete faith. And so too will our inner experiences enrich. And if we think about the terminally ill, dying to live. We are all terminally ill. We must all face death. Nobody escapes it. Nobody. The fear of the unknown and the terror of death practically overshadow everything we do in our lives. To help us cope with the fear of death, we close our eyes to reality and to take false comfort in certain illusions. The rituals of our rel religions also give us false hope. The mind is capable of making us ignore our death even though we see our friends and relatives pass over. Intellectually, we know it will happen, but we act as though we're here forever. We remain in denial. It's not that I'm afraid to die, I just don't know when it will happen. See, when we think about what I just said, the world sees death as an accident, kind of like a fluke, a tragedy, something that's unnatural, like a failure or something that's not supposed to happen. For most people, the idea of death is depressing. And we find it hard to accept as we hold on to the notion that maybe some way, maybe there's some way of fixing it or putting it off or hoping that someone has a way to survive bodily disillusion. And we fix so many things in life and we can solve so many problems, but so far nobody has been able to solve the problem of death. So when someone we love dies, we say, oh, we've lost them. You know, as though we were, they were ours to lose because we live in an illusory belief that we belong to each other and that our relationship don't come to an end. But Huzur says, you know, we must accept facts. Relationships are just karmic adjustments of our accounts. Somebody is a wife, somebody is a daughter. They come, they go on every stage. You hear this in satsang all the time. We must accept death when it comes and that this drama has finished. There's no use crying over spilt milk. We must accept facts and face life as it comes. We're taught the practice of dying while living. And that's through withdrawing our consciousness to the third eye center and listening to the music of the sound current, the audible live stream, our mind and the soul together rise out of the tomb of this body and become free from it. And by the grace of our master, we cut our attachments from the world and forget all of its troubles and miseries. Huzur said, you must withdraw to the eye center and then you will live forever. Otherwise, you're just living to die. And every time you live, you have to die. So die to live. 
Learn to die so that you may begin to live and live forever. Great Master wrote, One of the benefits of teaching of the saints is that the disciple crosses the gate of death in a state of happiness and thus conquers it. He loses all fear of death and every day he crosses its gate. Of course, it takes great courage to die while living, to let go of our hold of this world, to leave the self behind and to submit to the spiritual experience. But once we've crossed through the gates, the master says there is no fear. No fear of death because we've already died. No fear of the unknown because we have pierced the veil and we see what lies on the other side. No fear of losing what we have because we realize that we have nothing. And so this is freedom. Freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. Sant Namdev wrote, Through the word of my guru, I have realized my true self. While still living, I have learned to die. Now, I have no fear of death. To conclude, what is it that gives us strength and courage to travel the spiritual path? Where does it come from? Well, it comes from the master. He has planted the seed of love in us. It is that seed that pulls from within, that gives us the desire and the strength to devote ourselves to our practice. This is his grace without which we could never even think of the Lord. When the love for our masters grow, it gives us courage to do battle against the greatest of enemies, the mind, to climb up through the mountain of light within the body and to die while living, to annihilate the ego and to let go of our, of our separateness so that we can be with our beloved. It is all by performing the ultimate act of courage, of Simran and Bhajan done regularly and punctually with love and devotion. Thank you. Special thanks to our dear sister Shalina for her beautiful, beautiful talk, uh, her godly voice. Uh, she also sings for satsang sometimes, and it's uh, just wonderful. And Shalina, we miss your presence, uh, and thank you so much for your great seva. It was really, really, really wonderful. Uh, and you talked about the spiritual warriors, and we're all warriors for Master and for God. And uh, Swami Ji says, O oh soul, be absorbed in satsang at least this day. <laughs> so now I uh, will do five minutes of meditation to prepare ourselves for our Holy Master, our Holy Father, satsang. Uh, so five minutes of meditation. Thank you.
to see you. I'm very happy to be back in Northern California once again. Uh, many of you, I notice, have not seen me physically earlier. Some of you have seen me otherwise, but not in this way. So I'm very happy I can introduce myself and tell you what is the purpose of my coming here. I am a disciple of a great master, Hazur Maharaj Baba Savan Singh, and I am sharing his teachings here. He predicted many years ago, especially I heard him say that in 1937, I was 11 years old, he predicted that the axis of spirituality will shift to the West and localize itself in a very big way in the United States of America. He said this in the presence of an American disciple, Dr. Julian Johnson. I happened to be there. He wrote some letters in the same year, in 1937, to his disciples in the United States, that the spiritual path will be coming to, the, to your country. And he gave a reason. He said the reason is that most of the great masters on the true path to our true home to which we belong have come in the East and the Middle East. And people in the West, since they discovered the new territories and new countries, have been building up affluence and wealth, physical wealth. They have achieved the goal of creating a lot of physical wealth. But they are not satisfied. Many are depressed, many are lonely, many feel cut off from something real, and many are seeking for something beyond what they have got. What they are seeking is spiritual truth, a journey to their true home, which nobody has explained to them. On the other hand, the East, especially big countries like China and India, which produced many masters, will now shift over to getting what they lacked, physical wealth. So this shift will be that they will now strive, the Eastern countries will strive to be rich in physical terms, and the West will try to be rich in spiritual terms. <clears throat> this was a very interesting statement he made. And he made it many times. So I was very happy to hear that I had a nice job in India. And when I retired from my job with the government, they offered me still better job, the governorship of a state, a member of a planning board, which was a cabinet-like position for me. But I said that is not what I would like to see after retirement. I'd like to go and have a ringside seat in that country where the big spiritual show is going to take place. And that's why I came here and I'm sitting on a ringside seat and watching his prophecy come true. And more and more people in the West are now seeking the very truth that we were able to get from several masters in the East. I am here to share the teachings of the great master and what they can do for us. There are a few fundamental questions which I asked when I was young and people ask me today. All the religions say that the creative power, God, whatever name you give to the creative power, is inside us and has to be found by ourselves inside. If that is true, why do we need the intervention of a third party, an outside person, to help us find something that is inside us? Why do we need an intermediary? If the truth is inside us, God is inside us, then why are we not just finding it inside us? Why do we need an outside party? The answer is very interesting, but very accurate. The answer is that all our search, when we are in a physical body with a mind, 
is done by the mind. And we think that the one who thinks is ourself. It's a very big error. It's an error we have all fallen into. And even philosophers have thought that because we can think that thinking being is ourself. It is not. It's not easy to find that out. Because when we want to find out, we again use thinking. We have no other means to discover anything except by the use of our mind, except by the use of our intellect, except by the use of our thinking process. And thinking process confines us to the limitations that can be with the mind. Can you hear me now? No. Not yet. Okay, now we can. <laughs> it works. The progress we have made also includes this progress. See. <laughs> we have a limitation in our seeking, in our searching. Very big limitation which we can't even see. The limitation is that we cannot seek except with our mind. And mind has its barriers. Mind cannot go beyond what is not within time and space. That means mind takes time and space to be a given premise which you cannot cross. No thought can take place if, except with time and space. The mind creates and functions only in time and space. Our true home and the creative power lies beyond that. There is no way that the mind can find something that lies beyond its own capacity. And yet there are things that can go beyond the capacity of the mind. The spiritual path is one of those paths which goes beyond the mind and cannot be discovered by the mind. A very big limitation. Why is that? Because if we examine our own life, we'll notice that there are moments when we think and there are moments when we know something without thinking. People give different names to that awareness which comes without thinking. Some call it intuition, some call it gut feeling, some call it just inner voice. People give different names to something that happens which gives us awareness of something which is not consistent sometimes with what the mind is thinking. The, some feeling comes, we have to go somewhere. The mind says, no. Where's the other feeling coming from? Actually, our consciousness is made up of several things. When we understand the nature of our consciousness, what are the building blocks that make our consciousness, then we realize what it is that is beyond the mind. Our consciousness, can you still hear me? I think there's some problem. Okay. We, we have our experience of this physical world. Examine carefully. We have an experience of a physical world which we believe has been existing for billions of years. The entire experience of the physical world is coming to us through our sense perceptions, five sense perceptions. You cut these five perceptions out, there is no experience at all. There is no world at all. There is no creation at all. Do you see the limitation? that the entire experience of the entire world we have is based upon perception, created by these perceptions built into our sense organs. So we may have thinking based upon something that is not being perceived here, here. Let us take the mental perception. Our mental perception also comes from the sensory perceptions.
they gather together and all the input is from sensory perception. In fact, that is our world. Our perception is our world. That is why the consciousness in us is gathering the information of a physical world through physical sense perceptions. Do these physical perceptions account for all our consciousness? No. I remember one master in India is talking to another man who is a journalist. A journalist is asking him that why do you think there is something else other than our sense perceptions? He said, you have your eyes open and you can see me. That is your vision, one of the perceptions, one of the sense perceptions. Now close your eyes. Am I still there? Yes, you are still there. Is it memory or you feel I am there? No, you are actually there. How do you know if the eyes were the only one to tell us who is there? There's something else in us. Okay, that's not, a, that's not enough. People have dreams at night. They, we see in dreams. Are the same eyes seeing or some other eyes? We imagine things. We can imagine something visual. Are these eyes imagining? Another eye. Does the mind have other eyes that it can see? Does imagination come from somewhere else? The truth is that the sense perceptions, when they are built into the human body, they appear to be physical sense perceptions. But they operate without it also. Imagination, dreams, our knowledge of what is happening without seeing, without using these perceptions, still continues. But that is not all. By a process of meditation, meditating upon your own self, by withdrawing your attention to your own self from where you are thinking, from where your mind is, you can become unaware of the physical body and still all your perceptions will be intact. That is what, what is creating these perceptions in the dreams and in imagination. It's not coming from nowhere. The fact is we have sense perceptions independent of a physical body the organs of the physical body are picking up the power to perceive from the inner sense perceptions. And this can be found out very easily through a process which we call simple meditation at the third eye center behind the eyes. A lot of masters have recommended that. You want to find out if there is something more in you than what you are seeing here? Yes, just put your attention on your own self. The third eye center is called the third eye center because it is behind two eyes. It is like a third eye. It is, not un, it is not something unusual. Even when we are using two eyes, the way we see one image with two eyes is the same. We can go to a 3D cinema nowadays and they give you special glasses to wear and they convert two images into one image and things look like they are three-dimensional, they are coming near us. These two eyes see two pictures. We don't see two pictures. Without glasses, with these eyes, where are we seeing one picture? Where are we combining the two pictures to create the distance? Right here. We are combining behind these eyes at a common point just behind, like these two fingers where the two eyes, where they meet, is this distance behind where we are actually seeing even now. That's the only place where we combine the two images of the two eyes and see one image. That is the third eye center. There's no place to discover. Some people say, I have been doing meditation for a long time. I cannot find my third eye center. I said, you are at third eye center all the time when you're awake. You can't go anywhere else. Third eye center is from where we operate in wakeful state. Other states we lose that sense. We go to sleep, we are not even aware of our body, but we are not at the third eye center. We go down. That also can be tested. When we go to sleep, the third eye center, which now appears to be behind these eyes, that we are looking at things from behind the eyes, 
that itself shifts. To test this out, tonight, when you are feeling sleepy and about to sleep, you know you can touch your eyes with your eyes closed with your hands very easily. Try to touch your eyes when you are sleepy. And you will touch your nose and you will think you are touching your eyes. Because you are still awake, not completely asleep. Some yogis have a yogic practice by which they can retain some of their memory of wakeful state when they are going into deeper sleep and they know that it can be even further down. When you are dreaming, it goes into the throat center. And when you wake up, it comes back to third eye center. The wakeful state itself is connected with where we operate from. What is in the third eye center? The third eye center contains our self, true self, the only self is at the third eye center. What we have to discover about a creator, you first discover about yourself. The self is sitting right now inside our head at the third eye center. By a simple meditational process, which means putting your attention at the third eye center. Why attention? Because if you examine the nature of attention, which is a very essential part of use of application of consciousness, attention is what creates our experience of the world. You withdraw attention, the things disappear. You can have a simple test. We go to a musical festival, an orchestra, several musical instruments are playing there. And you say, I like the drums better. Put your attention on the drums, the drums become louder and other instruments become weaker. Put more attention on the drums, you can only hear the drums and nothing else. How can attention do that? Because it's the attention that's picking up all our perceptions. And that's a great ability. That means if we put attention on something, we can concentrate it at that point. That's the greatest gift given to us as human beings. The power to concentrate our attention wherever we like. We read books. We put attention on the book. We understand what the book is saying. Sometimes we are so much involved in it, we don't know who is standing next to us, who is anywhere else. We don't even know where we are. We can put so much attention. It's the same attention that we can put on our own self at the third eye center. It looks difficult because we have not done it. No other reason. We have lived our life placing our attention on outside things, outside experiences. All our life, we have been trained like that. A newborn baby is coming. We see in the eyes of the baby, little infant, baby thinking something. We don't know what he's thinking. He can't speak. We can't understand. And then we try to draw the attention of the baby. We play with jiggles and dolls and so on. And gradually, the baby grows up that the entire attention is used for outside experiences. <coughs> We lose touch with what is inside. It's just a matter of habit we have acquired that attention has always to be placed on something outside of ourselves. We don't know what is inside the head. We have no idea. It must be something, just a mass of brain and flesh and bones and whatever it is, just like the rest of the body. We have no idea that our whole wakeful experience is taking place from the head, from behind the eyes. There must be something more than that. When people try to put attention inside, it's a very difficult thing because they are used to putting attention outside. They try to make an outside inside their head. And i tell you how. People meditate for 30, 40 years, they tell me. I said, how do you meditate? We close our eyes and then we look at ourselves. If you look at something, it's not yourself. That means we don't care. We think because our eyes are closed, we have gone inside our head. Of course not. We are still trying to see with the same eyes, and they are closed, we can't see outside. So we, what we imagine, we think is inside. That is not true. 
This is the key of good meditation that instead of focusing attention on anything which always takes us out, we will draw attention to ourselves. Big difference between focusing attention and withdrawing attention. And people have missed this point and for years they have not followed this point that the true meditation, the true experience of meditation comes when you withdraw attention and not focus attention on anything. People have to imagine we must be something small sitting inside and we look at that person sitting inside. That must be our, ourself. Don't we realize that if we can see something, then we are the one who is seeing and not what we are seeing. But we make the big mistake. We make something a picture of ourselves. Now I'll tell you another secret that when we think we are seeing ourselves sitting in the third eye center, we are not even seeing inside our head, but outside. And I'll tell you how. Again, little experiment. You close your eyes and you imagine that you are sitting inside the head. Then bring your hands to your eyes slowly. And when you bring them, you'll feel your right, 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 reach the point where you see the image of yourself. And you will have crossed that by the time you touch your, even the images outside of your body. We are making external images and thinking we are meditating at the third eye center. Big mistake. And you can keep on doing it for a whole lifetime and get no concentration of attention on yourself at all. Withdrawal of attention is something different we haven't practiced. When we start practicing withdrawal of attention means put attention on wherever you are, not to see something, but to be aware of where you are, where are you seeing from, where are you operating from, what are you doing there, what you are, the self is doing, no matter what form of self you have, it's still conscious self. So this is a very important part which we miss and that is why not too many people have actually had experiences of their own self through meditation. But if you do meditation correctly, which means withdraw your attention to your own self, wherever you feel it is, because no matter what, when you are awake in the human body, you are at the third eye center. You're not to be searched some point or to be searched somewhere. You're already there. You have to just withdraw your attention to where you already are. With eyes closed, it helps. With closed ears, it helps. Outside distraction don't disturb you. But the point is that you have to withdraw attention. I had this problem for several years after initiation by great master. So I went to him and I said, why do I have this problem that I can't Imagine where I am, and I can imagine making a picture of myself. He gave me a little experiment. He said, raise your hand, like put a finger on top. Don't see it, just above your head, which I did. And he said, can you imagine, just imagination, can you imagine you're sitting up there? Think you are sitting up there. I, I say, I can imagine that, that I am not here, I'm sitting up there. He says, now bring it down. Are you still there? Yes. Are you still there? Yes. Jump in. I jumped in, I knew where I was. But it was just a way of explaining, you have to know where you are, not to see yourself. When you try to see yourself, then you move away from where you are, no matter how close you are. So just minor tip I'm giving you, but very important one, that when you withdraw your attention and hold it there for a reasonable time, which with practice will be zero second, it will be instant when you want to do it, because it will be practice. If you are there, you will find that you will be unaware of the physical body. You will be unaware of a physical universe, but you will be aware of another universe that opens up just by being there. Just like this universe has opened up by using sense perceptions in the physical body, a physical world comes into being. You withdraw your attention, all sense perceptions are intact. 
you can see very clearly. You can't see very clearly if you use sense perception through the eyes. I am getting old, I have to use lenses, I have to use something to be able to read or see. I can read 20, 20, even sharper with the inner eyes because there's no obstruction. Physical body has created certain obstruction to the use of our sense perception. When you are there, all sense perceptions open up completely. Whose sense perceptions are they? Yours, the self, nobody else. It's not somebody else coming and doing that. It's your own self opening up to something. And because you can see so clearly, then you look at yourself with those eyes, inner eyes. Once you are there, not looking at something else, but looking at your own self in which the perceptions are, you'll find you still have a body. You still have a body very similar to this. And when you try to see how hard the body is, does it still have the same bones? Looks like it has, but it has no matter in it. The shape, the experience of the inner body is being created by the same sense perceptions which are really creating the experience of the three-dimensional physical reality outside. And when you experience that, that you know that that is the inner self that you have, that has all sense perceptions. We sometimes call it the astral body, the sensory body. Oh, different names have been given. Some people say that's the real, some people call it the soul, that we have discovered our soul, the soul is inside the body. It also has the mind, the same mind. The mind has not changed. Your life has not changed, nothing has changed except that you are now unaware of a physical body and you are aware of something inside which has all mind, thinking, intuition and ability to do exactly what you are doing here but with no physical matter in you at all. When we have this body, it's controlled by the laws of the physical body. Biggest law being the law of gravity holds us here. There is no gravity holding the inner body because there is no physical matter in it. It looks so easy with the inner body to fly anywhere we like. Where would we like to fly if we have that? People say, I ask people, if you can fly inside, where would you like to fly? Oh, we'd like to fly to a new country, we'd like to fly to the galaxies, we'd like to... All physical destinations still. Nobody said I want to fly somewhere new, which I want, which doesn't exist here. They want to fly to what they have seen outside with the physical body. That is why that inner body operates in a strange world which looks like an overlap. That there is this world also, and there's another world also sitting at the same time. And we can go from one to the other. We have no physical body. All our friends can see us as nothing. We are invisible to them. We, they are visible to us. But we have the same eyes. It, it looks like there is a stage we can reach by withdrawing attention from the physical body where we can be in touch with this physical world and another world, the astral world. Why is it called the astral body and the astral world? Because the astral refers to a sky. We have a sky here. This sky, depending on this position of the sun and the earth, creates days and nights. Inner sky does not create days and nights. Inner sky the light itself is situated in such a way it's always lit up and everything that you will see with that body is lit up. My dear holy family, it's time to fly to another world and enjoy the blessings of Master God and the Kingdom of God. So if we can forget about the world outside and come up here where master is waiting have some 
beautiful gratitude words for master with love and devotion and listen to the holy shabd or listen or repeat the holy names and with the tongue of thought and i wish you the best meditation i hope to see you tomorrow for another holy day and holy father god enjoy i'll keep zoom on for 20 minutes